Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to University of Central Asia's online public lecture. My name is Shokat Ali Khan, and I am the Chief Information Officer here at the University of Central Asia. Our today's topic is when COVID-19 leads to digital transformation. And I'm really happy that today we have one of my favorite speakers, Dr. Ravi Pense. Dr. Ravi Pense serves as the Vice President for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer at the University of Michigan, USA. He is an executive officer and provides university-wide leadership and strategic direction for information technology. He is also a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. He has secured more than $21 million in external research grants, developed and taught courses in the areas of computer architecture, networking, and cybersecurity, earned several teaching awards, and published numerous scholarly articles co-authored with the students. His research interests include areas of Internet of Things, cybersecurity, and future of work. Dr. Pense holds a BS in Electronic and Communication Engineering from Osmania University in Hyderabad, India. He received his MS and PhD in Electrical Engineering from Wichita State University. He serves as a board member on the Global Customer Advisory Board of Cisco Systems, on the Higher Education Advisory Group of Microsoft, and as an independent director on the board of High te Touch Technologies. Please welcome Dr. Ravi Pansay. Um, Dr. Uh, thank you very much uh, for those kind words and, and the introduction um, and for your leadership. Uh, and uh, good evening to all of you and good morning from uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, I have fond, fond memories of uh, visiting your campus uh, last year, your beautiful campus, the incredible um, colleagues I got a chance to meet, and uh, the people of uh, Kyrgyzstan, just so friendly and wonderful. So thank you for those wonderful memories. And I'm looking forward to coming there in person as well. And uh, hopefully uh, once uh, this COVID-19 is behind us, uh, hopefully we can get together in person there and I'm happy to host you here in Ann Arbor, Michigan as well. So thank you, Shavkat, for those kind words. And I'll wait for you to uh, sh show the uh, screen and then we can continue the conversation. If you can go in the presentation mode. I, I hear a printer or something somewhere. <laughs> can the you see choice, my screen, Dr. Benjamin? Yeah. Yes, we can we can see the screen. So if you go, can go back to the first slide. Thank you. That's great. Terrific. Uh, are you all able to see the screen? Yeah, thank you. That's great. That's where we want to be. So, um, you know, this is an interesting title. Uh, I'm sure uh, you're all aware of uh, what's going on in the world. Uh, as of this morning, according to Johns Hopkins Global Tracker, in the world, there are about uh, 4.26 4 million cases of coronavirus, novel coronavirus or COVID-19 as it's called. Unfortunately, uh, we have lost uh, worldwide um, uh, close to 300,000 individuals who have lost their life. Uh, in the United States, um, there are close to 1.4 million cases as of this morning. And uh, unfortunately, about 82,000 plus people have uh, lost their lives. In the state of Michigan, where Ann Arbor is uh, and University of Michigan is, uh, we have had about 48,000 cases and uh, about uh, 4,600 people have lost their lives. So it's a very, very serious situation. And um, I'm in my second year at Michigan. Uh, prior to being at Michigan, I was at uh, Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, if somebody had said to me that, um, Dr. Pense, Ravi, in your second year, all of a sudden, overnight, you're going to take your entire institution completely online, I would have said to them, are you out of your mind? Uh, because uh, Michigan prides in its uh, residential education. Uh, and Shaukat, we can go to the next slide, please. Terrific, and if you can uh, click a couple of more times for the information to appear. Um, as you can see, um, University of Michigan, it's a large public world-renowned research university. Uh, we have uh, 19 schools and colleges. Uh, we have um, uh, actually two other campuses, one in Dearborn, Michigan, 
and third one is in Flint, Michigan. All together, uh, we have about 63,000 plus students. Uh, almost every pro graduate program and undergraduate program is ranked top 10 in the world. Uh, we have 7,000 plus faculty colleagues, uh, 15,000 plus staff. The university does about $1.6 billion in research. We have a very, very large health and academic medical center. Uh, under my leadership, we have about 2,700 plus IT professionals all across campus. The total budget of University of Michigan is about $9 billion. Half of it uh, comes from our hospital system, and the other half um, is for the academic area. And uh, our endowment is about $14 billion. So here's what happened. Yeah, go ahead, next slide, please. On uh, March 11th, uh, Shokat, next slide, please. Yeah, there we go, terrific. On March 11th, uh, President Schlissel, and if you can click one more time, Shoka. On March 11th, uh, President Schlissel announced uh, that uh, we are going to close the university for on March 12th and March 13th. So those were two working days. And starting on March 16th, we would be going completely online and would, we would be working completely remotely. So my staff colleagues who are amazing had uh, two days, two days to take literally 63,000 plus students completely online, 7,000 plus faculty members teaching hundreds of classes completely online. And oh, by the way, take all of our staff uh, and uh, provide environment where they can start working remotely. So how do you do that over a period of two or three days? A complete forced uh, digital transformation driven by uh, unfortunate circumstances of COVID-19. And he, here are some of the things we did. Uh, it was over, uh, overwhelming, I have to admit. I, we weren't prepared for it um, uh, because nobody expected it to be something so dramatic and drastic. While we were talking about it for a few weeks of what if scenarios, we didn't expect it to occur so quickly and as quickly as it did. So first thing we had to do was obviously evaluate all of our systems and ask the question, can our systems handle increased load due to obviously the remote work? One of the first things we had to do was ensure that we have enough capacity to provide VPN connections for 20, 30, 40,000 people who would be coming in via VPN connection. On an average day prior to COVID-19, there used to be maybe close to 500 or 1,000 connections every day. We had, to, we had to go from 500 plus connections to close to between 20 and 40,000 connections a day. Uh, that was significant. So we needed to make sure that along with our VPN um, tools and technologies uh, that we actually had capacity to handle that. We also needed to make sure that depending on the area that you work in, all of our different systems were available to uh, withstand uh, the challenges of uh, remote work. Another interesting example, research computing. We have a very, very large research computing center to support the $1.6 billion worth of research that occurs. Many contractual issues related to research computing involve using software while only on campus. So how do you now interpret that contract language and work with vendors to make sure that you're legally authorized to use this software now remotely under these strange circumstances. So while none of us are lawyers, we had to engage our uh, legal to help uh, navigate that. And I have to commend all of our vendors. They were very cooperative. And we had to make sure that all of that situation was available where people could actually access our high performance computing center and leverage all of that. We had to ask questions about <laughs> What tools would be most used? Obviously, our learning management system is Canvas. I'm sure you use similar systems there and other places around the world. And we had to ensure by having conversation with uh, Canvas's parent company, which is Instructor, that they were available and willing to um, provide the type of load that was going to come where everything was moving online. Uh, once we had confidence that our systems were ready to go, 
we had to do testing. But how do you test for 40,000 people suddenly using it? And um, luckily, we have a lot of simulation and emulation tools. We leveraged those and we did a lot of testing and we felt pretty comfortable that uh, we would be in a situation where we can support um, our faculty members. Now, infrastructure and these type of technologies were just one part. There were other parts to it, obviously. The other one was uh, what kind of support options and training offerings are available to our faculty colleagues. Please note that Michigan is a pretty much 100% residential campus. So a lot of our training support was dependent on in-person conversations and conversations where people could sit by side by side and provide training or have training classes that are in person where faculty colleagues other come and attend. We gather as a group, we share ideas and information. So we had to figure out how we're going to provide training and uh, training in use of Canvas, training in use of uh, uh, recording lectures, training in use of variety of different tools. Uh, and how do you then make sure that that training scales? So our staff developed over those two weeks two days period, hundreds of hours of training videos related to uh, use of all of these different tools that we envisioned our faculty colleagues would need and then made those available through video and then also made um, in person consultation through video available and all of that was done over a 48 hour period so that colleagues could uh, use the training. And, and leverage it. Uh, we also made sure that uh, we had, uh, can you go back, Shokan? Uh, one slide back, please. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, we also had to make sure that uh, we quickly moved to provide all the relevant resources. Now, what relevant resources are we talking about? Uh, resources such as, for example, prior to COVID-19 and us shutting down, we only had one video conference conferencing tool available for the entire campus to use, and that was BlueJeans. And uh, while BlueJeans is a terrific tool and is used a lot, we wanted to make sure we had additional options available. So we made sure that we also signed a contract over the weekend with Zoom, and we also made uh, Zoom available. Uh, we made Adobe Creative Cloud available to the entire campus for leveraging the power of uh, Adobe tools. and. Um, we listened to the campus. We wanted to talk to them and find out from them what was needed. We continuously monitored and uh, learned from what was going on as these training sessions were happening. And the idea was uh, continuous evaluation, continuous listening, and then making sure that there is continuity in everything that we were doing and uh, connecting with the community and ensuring uh, that things were happening. We had to also develop some inbuilt software as an example, typically, and I'm sure those of you who are faculty members may relate to this, students may come to your office and stand outside your office to meet you. And sometimes there is a line that forms. Now, how do you create that line digitally on all the variety of different tools that we use? So our staff, our developers wrote a special inbuilt code that mimicked an actual queue outside the office and then connected it, integrated it with Canvas, Zoom, Blue Jeans, and all of these other tools so that people could use it. And so what I noticed was that while this was a forced digital transformation, the entire team came together and we were able to provide all of this. So it was a very simple leadership lesson, which was uh, think about the problem, identify the steps, uh, get the right team together, trust them to execute and make things happen. And that's what our campus did. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So when we think about uh, lessons learned, uh, one of the lessons that we learned was the change, which we already know, and you've heard me say this potentially before, that change is a six letter word and so is leader, and change and digital transformation can happen very, very quickly. Just to give you an idea, since March 16th, uh, when we went completely live to as of last week, we have had, in terms of participant minutes, 269 years worth of participant minutes in blue jeans and zooms since March 16. Please notice that's only about seven, seven to eight weeks. And so in about two months time, we've had 269 years worth of time being spent on uh, Zoom and on blue jeans and variety of other tools. And that's an incredible number. So we're asking 
And about 20% of this time is for instruction, if you're curious. So the other 80% uh, is where people are meeting with each other, people are learn learning from each other and um, leveraging um, you know, a lot of these tools. And as we think about this environment, obviously there are lots of different lessons that we can learn from this. Uh, prior to this, uh, we couldn't have imagined that the entire university can function like this completely online. And so obviously we have learned a lot of interesting lessons. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, Shauka, thank you. And yeah, thank you. So uh, we are talking about a lot of different things. Yeah, if you can go to the previous slide, thank you. Uh, for example, um, prior to this, and uh, I hope you all of you get to visit uh, University of Michigan campus someday. It's a beautiful, beautiful campus. And one of the challenges on campus is uh, challenges around parking. But now that everybody is working from home, we don't have a parking problem. In fact, we jokingly say, what parking problem? Because there are no cars in any of our parking lots right now since everyone is working from home. So one question we have to ask is, I don't think we need to build new parking lots. What we need to do is manage uh, the how people work and when they work. And if we can do that, there wouldn't be any parking problem and we would not have to waste money building new parking lots. And so that's a lesson that's coming from the digital transformation that occurred. Another interesting area is space, office space, lab space. Uh, if you can go back, Shoka, please, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, office space, lab space, and so on. And um, we don't have uh, that problem as well anymore because uh, we, are, we have recognized that most people can work from home, uh, which that, that means we can organize differently. Another interesting thing we are finding out in our hospital A system, which is one of the top hospital systems in the world, as you may be aware, that many patients are actually preferring, are liking visiting with their doctors through video. So telemedicine has certainly taken off because many elderly who need to be driven to hospital and sometimes can be exposed to unfortunate viruses and so on. They're not exposed to any of that if they're being checked from home. So many patients are actually saying, I like telemedicine. So we are learning a lot of different lessons. Uh, we are collecting enormous amount of data uh, through classroom interactions, uh, all being done digitally, uh, how many office hours people are spending time in and all of that. And all of that data is going to be incredibly useful as we think about uh, life after COVID-19 as to how we organize as an institution, how we relate to our patients, how we relate to our students, how faculty can interact with other faculty. So there are a lot of interesting lessons to be learned, including the medium we are currently using, where while I would love to be with you in uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, right now we are able to do this uh, uh, remotely and uh, with a uh, few glitches because of my uh, uh, inability to share, we, we are doing well. And so uh, next slide, please. And if you can clear, thank you. Uh, one other lesson that we learned is that um, this is also a very stressful time for staff. Um, and the reason I say it's a stressful time is uh, what is happening around you is not normal, at least in Michigan, because of all the cases around us, and uh, you know, with the mortality rate of close to 9%, uh, people, naturally human beings, are scared and they're terrified of potentially catching coronavirus. And if you get it, am I gonna die? Uh, is somebody in my family going to die? You know, people, people worry. And in an environment like this, uh, you can't be doing your normal work. So sometimes people are going to fail. And as a leader, I have to acknowledge that and recognize that it's okay to fail. Maybe it's okay not to be your full 100% all the time. Uh, people are displaced and stuck at different places away from families, and they're not going to be able to do their full work. Similarly to our students. Our students may not be able to do their uh, complete, um, uh, give their complete attention uh, to academic work. So as faculty members, we have to recognize and acknowledge that and give them enough room and be patient with them uh, to work through. Faculty colleagues have to be uh, patient with their colleagues, uh, with each other, because again, this is not a normal world we are living in right now. And until a vaccine is developed and until we get through this uh, uh, you know, pandemic, uh, we're gonna have to learn to be patient with each other. So I do believe that as part of, because of this 
uh, COVID-19 virus, along with the transformation of digital technologies that's happened, we as human beings are also becoming more kinder and hopefully more patient with each other and recognizing how we can be supportive of each other.